the last person for that you've made it it's the end I can't tell you how long the end's gonna be because that's up to Sandy <laughs> but Sandy is the end the end of today uh, Sandy is also the beginning uh, we would not be in this room we would not be having the symposium we would not be the community that we are that I count myself as a member of if it wasn't through the efforts of Sandy Siegel um, I could go on for his entire uh, time to speak uh, talking accolades about him but I consider him one of the world's best patient advocates, a dear friend, uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, his perspective on the history of what's really been a tremendous organization that's been built from the ground up. So, Sandy. <laughs> it is really an honor for me to be speaking to all of you about the Transverse Myelitis Association story. Believe it or not, in 16 years, this is the first time uh, we've ever been asked to tell this story, so it's, it's an honor. Um, the story started for uh, us the same way that it started for all of you. Uh, at the end of June in 1994, at 5.30 in the afternoon, pa Pauline, a totally healthy 35-year-old person, was inexplicably totally paralyzed from the waist down. And I'm gonna, I'll shorten the story because I see the egg timer sitting over here. But the, uh, Pauline, we, we didn't, we had wonderful physicians, but nobody gave us a very uh, good explanation as to what happened to Pauline, what we could anticipate uh, in the future in terms of what kind of recovery she was going to have, or is it, was it possible for this to ever happen to her again? We were totally in the dark, and like all of the rest of you, when we got the, when we heard the words transverse myelitis, we were hearing those words for the first time. We knew no one else who had transverse myelitis, so we had no idea what to expect from Pauline's future, and it was frightening, as I'm sure it was for all of you, except there was no TMA website, there was no Dr. Kerr, uh, and uh, there was a lot less literature, medical literature, about transverse myelitis or any of these other disorders like neuromyelitis optica or ADEM. The, the story really starts with Dick and Deanne Gilmer who had an 18-month-old child who got transverse myelitis. And it, it, in 1994, Deanne published a very small article in the National Organization of Rare Disorder newsletter uh, expressing an interest in getting a support group together. So Pauline and I saw that and we were so excited, we sent a letter to Deanne and uh, a, a couple of months went by and we were really surprised because usually when you send a a letter to an organization, you at least get back a remittance envelope. Whether you hear anything or, or not, there is at least that, and we didn't get that. So finally, I uh, called her on a, a Sunday afternoon, and we had a wonderful conversation, and I hung up the phone, and I said to Pauline, this woman is really overwhelmed by raising a child who has transverse myelitis and she's got stuff going on in her life. If something's going to happen here, I think I might have to get involved. And Pauline's response was, are you sure? Because people are nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, people have proven out to be pretty nuts over the last 16 years, but I went and did it anyway. Uh, under Dick and Deanne's guidance, we became incorporated in the state of Washington, and they went through the grueling process of becoming a 501c3 organization, which I am very grateful for. 
Uh, it was also under Dick's guidance that we developed our bylaws. He was sort of the adult among us. And, um, and then we uh, uh, established our organization with the officers that we currently have. Uh, most unfortunately, Dick Gilmer passed away a few years ago and we started an, an, a, a research endowment fund in his name to honor his memory. Um, we are a very grassroots organization and our history is really a very personal history. Um, one of Pauline's physicians at Dodd Hall, the rehabilitation center at The Ohio State University, uh, was Dr. Chuck Levy. And Dr. Levy ran the uh, wheelchair and gait clinic there. He knew we were involved in getting this support organization off of the ground. And Chuck approached us and said, you know, you, you probably need a medical advisory board. And we were pretty naive about what we needed. And so we just, you know, nodded our heads like bobblehead dolls. And uh, Chuck started our medical advisory board. And he approached uh, Joanne Lynn, Dr. Lynn, who spoke earlier today, who at the time was one of the directors, was a co-director of the MS Center at Ohio State University, and asked Joanne if she would also serve on our medical advisory board. And so our first two medical advisory board doctors from Ohio State were uh, Chuck and Joanne. Joanne also happened to be one of Pauline's physicians. Um, the first gathering of the Transverse Myelitis Association happened in 1997 at a meeting that Chuck put together for a group uh, called Fibrodysplasia Ossificans Progressiva International, FOP International. Um, he did this in conjunction with the National Organization of Rare Disorders, and while he was bringing these groups together, he said, Sandy, why don't you invite the Transverse Myelitis Association and we'll, we'll do a, uh, uh, a program collaboratively. So we thought that was totally fantastic and we sent an invitation out at that time to probably just around 100 members that we had in the association. Um, and the the picture, the far picture, are all the people from the Transverse Myelitis Association who attended. It was the first time I had met the other officers of the association, and that's where we also had our meeting with Dr. Lynn, which was fantastic. Um, FOP is a, a horrible genetic disorder that only affects a few hundred people. It, it's, I, I'm not going to get into what this disorder is about, but it was a truly, uh, I, I left that symposium, Ben, you won't be surprised by this, but I would just cry uncontrollably for about two weeks after being in the room with these people. It was mind-numbing. Um, but the thing that it did was it showed us how powerful it was to bring a group of people together who understood the experience in a way that nobody else really understood it. Uh, and the, it was, they had scientists, they had clinicians uh, who were involved in their community, but really the power was bringing these families together who were dealing with all of the problems surrounding this FOP diagnosis. And we left that meeting saying to ourselves, we have to do this for the transverse myelitis community. So thank you, Chuck, because you're the one who made that happen for us. Um, in January of 1997, we published the first uh, Transverse Myelitis Association newsletter, and it was mailed out at that time to our 187 members. Um, the only way you found us is by uh, 
getting a hold of a Nord newsletter because there was no internet to be looking for anything. Um, and most of our members were from the United States and Canada. Uh, at the same time that we mailed that first newsletter, I, we understood very clearly in 1997 that there was just a, an amazing paucity of information about transverse myelitis. So I put together a four-page survey, very rudimentary, uh, uh, and really based on our own anecdotal experience with transverse myelitis, and we sent it out to these 187 members. And Jesse Danninger um, became involved in doing this work with me, uh, and over a period of seven years until 2004, we continued to send this survey out to everyone who got a new member packet when they enrolled in membership in the association. And so over a period of those seven years until 2004, when we closed the survey, we sent this to about 5,000 people and we had 815 respondents to the survey. In 2004, Jesse and I, uh, uh, presented very preliminary results from this research. If you ever, if you want to see it, it's on symposia information on our website. You go to the 2004 symposium and you can watch this early presentation. But I would ask, I will tell you that within the next year, we plan on finally publishing the results out of this uh, research, and I, we look forward to doing this kind of research in the future with uh, web-based closed, web-based surveys and closed-ended questions. This survey was 32 open-ended questions and it took us two years just to code the data so that we could quantify it. So that was, this is my last open-ended survey for the rest of my life. <laughs> but it was because in 1997, we did not know any of the answers to the questions, and if you're going to do a closed-ended survey, you have to know every possible answer. Well, at least now, I know a few doctors who know a lot more answers, so it'll be easier. In 1997, uh, Jim Lubin totally changed the world for people with transverse myelitis, and I would argue also for people with NMO, optic neuritis, and ADEM. Uh, Jim established the Transverse Myelitis Association website, and he, in, in 1997, AOL was an infant company, and they offered all their members two megabytes to a, set up a website, which is what Jim did. Um, from there, it has become probably the greatest resource that the association has, and we are so proud of Jim's work. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Jim, uh, he's an officer, board member of the association, got transverse myelitis when he was 21 years old, and he's been full quadriplegic and ventilator dependent for over 20 years, and Jim does all of this work by sipping and puffing Morse code into an adaptive device. Uh, shortly after Jim set up the website, he uh, developed an electronic form so that people could sign up for membership online. Well. The combination of being able to sign up for membership in this way, along with being able to find uh, our association by doing an internet search, has resulted in our membership growing from 187 members in 1997 to just about 8,000 members today from more than 80 countries around the world and we grow at about 40 to 60 people a month. Uh, we would have a lot more members than this, but because people are nuts, they don't send us their uh, forwarding addresses when they move, and we lose a lot of people. The churn is pretty significant. 
on people who move. Um, this is our brand uh, for now. Um, uh, Jim found this uh, uh, font which we used uh, for the association. We call this color Lubin Blue. It's Jim's favorite color. Um, and because I can't even draw a stick figure, we came up with the logo at the time. There, weren't, there wasn't a lot of clip art on the uh, internet in those days, so this is a compass with the end cropped off of it. So if you're wondering what our logo means, it means there's a compass with the end clipped off of it. <laughs> Uh, we started sending new member packets um, fairly early on. So here's sort of what the philosophy was for us. Uh, if you, whether you have transverse myelitis, NMO, ADEM, or optic neuritis, you are likely living in a community where you don't know any other people who have this. And whether you live in Kansas or Sri Lanka or Ghana, or Pakistan, we want to make sure that you get something mailed to you that shows up in your mailbox so that there is some physical evidence that you really aren't alone. And that has been a cornerstone of our philosophy about what this commun community means and how important reaching out to people really is that that's why we send this uh, new member packet out to people, and it's become incredibly expensive to do, but um, we continue to do it. Um, building on our experience with uh, the, the FOP in Nord meeting that Chuck put together, uh, we held our first real a symposium in Seattle in 1999 and it was just an experience beyond words it's what we're doing here for the first time it was the first time that a community of about a hundred people were meeting each other um, and it was what this is going to be for many of you who are attending a symposium for the first time And Chuck attended, and Joanne was there. And probably one of the most exciting things that happened uh, at this symposium, you saw in uh, Dr. Weinschenker's, uh, or it was the presentation about acute therapies, about the study that Dr. Weinschenker had done in 1999 on plasma exchange, the clinical trial, the first public uh, uh, demonstration of those results Dr. Weinschenker did at this symposium. Uh, so we've known each other since 1999. That's where we met. It was also the first board meeting that the Transverse Myelitis Association had, and that is a, a demonstration of Jim's total disinterest in and all board matters. Um, we voted at this meeting uh, not to have membership fees uh, for the association and that too remains a cornerstone of our, uh, of our association. Uh, and we are totally grassroots. Um, when the phone rings at the international uh, headquarters of the Transverse Myelitis Association. Pauline and I answer the phone in the kitchen. Um, the world was forever changed uh, for a person with transverse myelitis in 1999, and it started at this symposium in Seattle. Uh, Doug Kerr was the chief uh, neurologist or chief resident of neurology at Johns Hopkins. He was just finishing up his residency and he came to speak at, uh, at the symposium and the photograph on the left really ought to be bronzed. Uh, 
That is Deanne, uh, Doug, his cousin Gunny. Uh, how many of you know Gunny from the Transverse Smilitis Internet Club? Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, and myself when I was sumo wrestling. Uh, <laughs> I, Doug uh, will tell you that um, he got involved in doing this work after uh, being, being hounded mercilessly by his cousin, uh, Gunny. But I believe the real story of uh, how Doug got involved in, in deciding to specialize in transverse myelitis and starting the TM Center was the impact that uh, he experienced from being in that room of 100 people for that weekend and seeing how having this really rare disorder had changed their lives and wanting to make a difference in their lives. And if anyone ever has any confusion at all about what it means for someone to announce a specialization in transverse myelitis, I'll send you this photograph. This is Kusha in Iraq. Can all of you, is it large enough to see the photograph he has on his lap? Can everyone see that in the back? That is a photograph of Dr. Kerr. If you don't think that it matters for somebody to express in the medical community that they care to make a difference, it matters to people. And um, shortly after the symposium in Seattle, I got a telephone call from Deanne. Uh, telling me that she was just way too overwhelmed to do all of the work that um, was really uh, needed to happen uh, from the president, and she asked me uh, to take over, and um, so I did. And that, that, those are the current officers of the Transverse Myelitis Association. Debbie is our secretary who I believe I found on the Transverse Myelitis Internet Club, and Paula, who got transverse myelitis when she was 12 years old. Uh, Deanne found her out in Seattle. Uh, and then Jim Lubin, uh, I found Jim by doing a, a, a search for transverse myelitis, and his name came up. Uh, and Pauline and I found uh, information about Jim. So those are the officers. Um, I am never confused about the fact that the most important thing I do is pick up my telephone. Um, how many people in this room have spoken to me on the telephone? That's why I'm not confused. But it is daunting to see your home telephone number on the NIH website, I have to tell you. <laughs> um, probably one of the most interesting things that have happened to us over the years is how we became an advocacy organization for not just transverse myelitis, but ADEM, NMO, and optic neuritis. And I will tell you that from the time that we actually became aware of the fact that we had members with these other neuroimmunologic disorders, we play no favorites. We have every bit as much concern about the research that's going on on ADEM and NMO and optic neuritis as we do on transverse myelitis. You can ask any of the doctors in this room whether that's the case or not. Um, we are the Transverse Myelitis Association because I just don't have the energy to do anything about the name. So, uh, <laughs> but, so that's the honest reason for it. But we do advocate for everyone. I could 
talk for five hours about how this happened, but I'm going to try to give you the classic comic book version of this. A number of times today, you have heard people describe ADEM as being an inflammatory attack in the brain and transverse myelitis. And you heard people describe neuromyelitis optica as optic neuritis and transverse myelitis. I had no idea what neuromyelitis optica was. I had no idea what acute disseminated encephalomyelitis was. But people were being told they had transverse myelitis. They were being told other stuff too, but they were thinking they also had transverse myelitis. So they were joining the association. And over time, what we began to learn was what this classificatory mayhem was all about. And that's the part of this I will choose not to get into so that you guys can actually eat dinner sometime tonight. But suffice it to say that uh, these people found us because of the, the way these disorders are talked about. And I really, I think part of the repair of this problem has to do with the nomenclature. Um, all right, I'm already drifting into it, so I'm backing out. <laughs> the other thing that we did in 1999 was we decided to uh, uh, facilitate um, support groups around the country and around the world. And in addition to the geographic support groups that we have, we have support networks for uh, neuromyelitis optica, for ADEM, for optic neuritis, for people who have these neuroimmunologic disorders and also have a rheumatic disorder. Uh, uh, Donna uh, started a group for uh, uh, pregnancy and um, uh, uh, OBGYN issues. So we have gotten, and I just, somebody just volunteered to uh, get a group going that uh, is focused on people who have Lyme's disease. So, I mean, we, we take all comers. That's basically what we've been about. If you, if there, I mean, there was no support network for people with NMO. There was no support network for people with ADEM. There was no support network for people with optic neuritis, and we figured out pretty quickly that it didn't make sense to look at just one of these disorders. There is a relationship here, and there is going to be some benefit to looking at all of them collectively. So there, there are a lot of very positive research issues to do it this way, and a lot of very important social benefits to be derived. And that is the rest of our support. We have support groups everywhere. Lou, are you in the room? Raise your hand. Lou is heads our UK support group and does a tremendous amount of work, not just in the UK, but also helping to organize uh, our groups in Europe. And he's in constant communication with those people. Uh, Ivan, raise your hand, please. Ivan is our support group leader in Sri Lanka. Um, uh, if you're a support group leader, raise your hand. I mean, it's just amazing how many people get involved to do this work, and they're all volunteers. And these are some of the photographs of people from who are our support group leaders from Israel, from Denmark, um, from Ireland, Scotland, Germany. There's Lou in the picture with uh, Jim. Uh, New Zealand, uh, there's a picture of Abhijit, our support group leader in India with Pauline's and my youngest son, David, who made a trip over there with his wife, Kat. Uh, Brazil, South Africa, Denmark, uh, we now have a support group in Canada that is recognized by the Canadian government, and uh, Nana Ya from Ghana. Um, 
Um, I'm not going to talk very much about this slide except to recognize Jeff Treglon, who was our uh, support group leader in the UK up until about three years ago, Lou, is that? About three years ago, um, Jeff passed away and he did, he was such a gentleman, he was such a British gentleman and he did so much wonderful work and his loss was uh, a real loss for the Transverse Myelitis Association and also for the UK Society. And I personally am just incredibly grateful for Lou stepping in and doing all of the work that, uh, uh, that he has over these few years. Uh, our support networks have um, their own websites and uh, 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 are able to use, um, uh, you know, uh, be able to manage language differences or they can announce their own meetings, which the UK group is going to be having next year. Is that right, Lou? Conference next year. <laughs> Um, and we have a lot of different ways to network with our members. We have a membership directory, which helps people find other people with these disorders locally. Our internet club is probably one of the oldest listserv groups on the internet. Uh, we have extensive message boards and forums. Uh, we're on Facebook. Uh, we have a uh, YouTube area, we're on Twitter. Uh, if there's a way to communicate on the internet, Jim has found it. Um, uh, another really interesting project that we've had is our volunteer translation projects with members from more than 80 countries around the world. It's really important that we have the ability to get as much information out to people in as many different languages as possible. And because we don't have money, uh, Jim found a volunteer translation group that has all of those flags uh, on that page are articles that have been translated into all of those different languages and all of that work has been done by volunteers. Uh, and that is, uh, Joanne and Chuck's article that is translated into Japanese there, uh, and also their article translated into Russian. It's been probably, that article's been translated into as many different languages as anything on our website. Um, and just to give you some sense of just how amazing this journey really is, uh, Federica found us and um, volunteered to translate many, many articles into Italian for us. And she became so involved with our community over time that she eventually volunteered to start a support network in Italy. Uh, before she got involved in this uh, volunteer project, she didn't know anybody with transverse myelitis. She didn't know what it was. She got involved to do something good by volunteering to do these translations and she became very much attracted to the cause and just shows you how amazing people can really be when they're not being totally nuts. Um, we have had so many different important collaborations with the Johns Hopkins TM Center. Uh, we've had symposia with them in uh, uh, 2001 and 2004 that are very similar to the symposium that is going on today with a concurrent uh, science program and clinical program. Um, and we have also collaborated with uh, Cody Unser's First Step Foundation. They have been very, uh, very, very creative and very active in ha getting education programs out uh, to the transverse myelitis community. And they held a symposium in California in 2002 and uh, another one in Albuquerque in 2007. 
and these programs are what you're experiencing this weekend. Uh, and one of the most important aspects of these uh, symposia are the friendships that are formed uh, between people who attend these. And I'm looking at that picture on the bottom. Those are all parents of children who got transverse myelitis when they were about six months old. And those parents are in touch. They have become very, very, very close friends. They vacation together. They are constantly communicating with each other because they are, and they are offering support to each other uh, on the many occasions they need it. It's an incredibly challenging experience for a six-month-old uh, to get these disorders because of all of the developmental issues. And of course, with every symposium, Pauline complains about how grueling the whole thing is. And these are all photographs that were taking, taken at Pauline at symposia. <laughs> um, and as I mentioned earlier, we recognize that many people can't get here to see these uh, physician presentations. So we, everything is posted on our website all of the clinical program will be posted on our website probably in about a month or so from now. So you'll, people who weren't here, people who are here who want to see a presentation again will be able to get on and watch it. And if you want to get some sense of the value this education uh, means for people, the videos since uh, till July 2010 were viewed 67,000 times, and they were downloaded almost 33,000 times. Um, one of the best things the Transverse Myelitis Association did was to provide a grant to the Johns Hopkins TM Center to uh, hire a research coordinator whose name was Chitra Krishnan. And um, over the years, uh, probably nobody has been involved in more advocacy work or more research on transverse myelitis than Chitra. Uh, she also became the executive director of Project Restore. Uh, and Chitra is the only uh, medical advisory board uh, person for the Transverse Myelitis Association who is not a physician and um, uh, you wouldn't know sometimes. Uh, the other very important thing that happened for our community was that uh, Bruce Downey became uh, chair of uh, Project Restore. Uh, Bruce got transverse myelitis and was very interested in getting involved in uh, motivating research and he's probably raised more money for transverse myelitis research than anyone. Uh, the Johns Hopkins Transverse Myelitis Center, uh, uh, Transverse Myelitis Center has done a, uh, a wonderful job of publishing and doing research on transverse myelitis. Uh, in 2002, uh, Dr. Kerr and a group of uh, people that he put together, physicians and researchers, to decide on diagnostic criteria for idiopathic transverse myelitis. And in many ways, what he was attempting to do with this work was to address the issues that Dr. Weinshanker brought up about the classification of transverse myelitis because what this uh, diagnostic uh, uh, process involves is making sure that you rule out compression to the cord or radiation myelopathies or vascular causes of transverse myelitis to try to narrow it down to what we know to be this other thing that most of you in this room have. Um, there, 
the publications that came out of the TM Center about transverse myelitis uh, have done a tremendous job to not just educate uh, the medical community, but also to help educate all of us in this room from the patient community. And I have to say that Dr. Kerr was always far more gracious in acknowledging the support he got from the transverse myelitis than the real support he was getting financially from the transverse myelitis association. Um, so along the lines of some of the other publications and research out of the TM Center, a very important study that Dr. Greenberg was involved in was this retrospective analysis that took a look at what kind of uh, recoveries people had in different, using different acute therapies depending upon how they presented, what kind of symptoms they presented with. And that was a tremendously Im important study, which I get phone calls all the time from physicians around the world who are looking for information about uh, acute therapies, and I direct them to that article all the time. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Greenberg has been uh, very active and interested in trying to get information out to the general practice uh, community and also emergency physicians. How many of you with transverse myelitis or neuromyelitis optica or ADEM had a difficult first experience in an emergency room uh, at onset? Well, that is precisely the reason that Dr. Greenberg uh, wrote that article. And very interestingly enough, he wrote that article with a general practice physician who has transverse myelitis. Uh, we had been having symposia for adults, and we saw the power of, of what those meetings were like, bringing together people such as yourselves for this experience. But we knew that there was something truly unique going on with children, and we thought it was really important that we provide some kind of opportunity to get families together for the same kind of experience. So in 2001, we decided we were going to have a children's and family workshop in, in Columbus, and we brought together all these doctors, and, um, and by the way, they paid their way, they brought their families. While the doctors were uh, doing presentations to parents, their spouses were helping with take care of the children who came. It was an amazing, amazing time. Um, but I spent every day for an entire year raising money for this so that parents wouldn't have to pay for anything. And I discovered in 2002 that I am the worst fundraiser known to humankind. Um, but it was, a, it was a great experience. And this is uh, some of the photographs from, uh, from that weekend. We took the young children to the Columbus Zoo and to a science museum. We brought Maureen Halligan in, who was a librarian who read books to the kids and played guitar. There's a picture of Cody as a young teenager down on the bottom. And there is uh, Dr. Kerr and Dr. Barnes in the group photographed with the children. Pauline uh, put a group together for the older teens um, and uh, the Columbus Parks and Recreation Department and Children's Hospital helped us put together an adaptive recreation program which we took the older kids on for a couple of days. That's our youngest son, David, uh, in, the, in the bottom picture. And is Nikki, do you see the picture of Nikki, Fran? <laughs> Um, so we had this incredible work uh, family workshop in Columbus, and then Pauline announced to me that it was a really wonderful thing, but she would never let me do anything like that ever again. And so I asked a group of parents to try to find 
another experience for our families. And the short story is they found uh, Victory Junction Gang Camp in North Carolina. This was the uh, camp that the Petty started started to honor their son Adam after he was killed in a racing accident. That's a very dark picture on the top left, but that's Kyle Petty with the officers of the association. Um, and uh, we held a uh, older teen and young adult retreat in 2006, 2008. We brought these kids in from all over the country. The physicians, that's uh, Dr. Kerr and Dr. Kaplan with the medical director from camp, Dr. Sim. We do an education program with these, uh, with the young people. Um, and then it's, it's a, just a fun camp. I mean, that is Jim Lubin on the stage on the top right, full quadriplegic ventilator dependent doing the chicken dance on the stage on Saturday night. Uh, after every uh, breakfast and dinner, there's dancing, and there's Keizu and Pauline dancing. Uh, and then in 2000, and I should say, and we're going to be having a, uh, a retreat weekend in a couple of weeks, and we have eight physicians who are, many of whom are sitting in this room, who are going to be attending um, uh, that retreat weekend, and it is going to be the largest gathering of people with ADEM ever, anywhere, and Martha Mann is going to be coming. You saw only 24 people uh, have enrolled in the repository with ADEM, and we're really hoping that we can bump that number up significantly at the retreat weekend that's coming up. So every other year, we've also had a family camp for uh, children who uh, are six years old to 16 years old with transverse myelitis. We do it the same way. We bring in families from all around the world. We bring in the doctors to do an education program. And it is an absolutely awesome time. That is Dr. Kerr living his inner eight-year-old uh, in the bottom right picture with the sunglasses on, on the motorcycle with the squirt guns on it. <laughs> um, in 2006, uh, Pauline announced to me that it was totally ridiculous that I was calling a 100-page thing a newsletter so she said, why don't you call it something else? So because I do everything she tells me, I started calling it a journal. Um, this is a, a photograph of, or a s series of photographs of how we used to do the mailing until, believe it or not, until not that long ago, really. It was a, we used to bring together the Ohio support group in our family and we stuffed all of these newsletters in a school, Pauline's old elementary school, and that's what was going to get mailed sitting on the floor of our garage. Um, we don't do it that way anymore uh, because I don't have the energy for it, and we are doing our mailings now to 8,000 people, and we have this really incredible international mailing team uh, that helps us to do all of our mailings now. Um, in 2009, Dr. Greenberg uh, came to the University of Texas Southwestern, which we are all benefiting from tremendously this weekend, and initiated the transverse myelitis in NMO centers. Uh, the officers of the association talked to Doug and said, we, we really ought to go check the place out. So we came to Dallas and um, had a, a wonderful meeting with Ben and uh, uh, talked about many, many different issues involving our community um, and decided that everything looked pretty cool. <laughs> uh, that is Doug in the bottom right picture trying to teach Keizu how to swim. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, these are the physicians on our medical advisory board. Uh, it, you've heard from a number of them today. Uh, Dr. Barnes, a pediatric neurologist. Uh, Dr. Bowen, a neurologist. Of course, Dr. Greenberg. Uh, Dr. Kerr and Dr. Kaplan. Uh, Chitra Krishnan, Dr. Levy, uh, who you will hear about, uh, hear from tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Lynn and uh, Dr. Pitcock. And um, the picture of Dr. Lynn is, for those of you who didn't see the newsletter that I just mailed out, uh, is with one of her medical students who just graduated this past June. Uh, Al got ADEM about eight years ago uh, he just graduated from The Ohio State University's medical program and began his uh, residency in neurology uh, at Henry Ford in Detroit. And if he knows what's good for him, he will be an ADEM expert. Uh, Dr. Carlos Pardo has become the director of the Transverse Myelitis Center at Johns Hopkins, which we are very excited about. Uh, Carlos has been involved uh, from the very beginnings of, uh, of the Transverse Myelitis Center. There isn't anybody who understands this disorder any better than he does. And we're very grateful that he, uh, for his willingness uh, to take over the directorship. Um, because we're a very grassroots organization, uh, we have found every conceivable way there is to raise money, and these are some of the fundraising programs that we have, from selling wristbands to the Reading for Rachel program to the greeting cards. Uh, we do everything we can to try to raise funds. Uh, next to Cody, Probably the hardest working person in the Transverse Myelitis Association is in terms of awareness is Alan Rucker. Alan got uh, transverse myelitis, I believe, in 1998 or 99, and he wrote uh, a really wonderful book called The Best Seat in the House. Uh, Alan is a Hollywood writer, uh, has a wonderful sense of humor, um, he has become a regular contributor to New, Mobi New Mobility Magazine and also Ability Magazine. He's appeared on Montel Williams and also NPR. And every time Alan is out in public talking, he's talking about these neuroimmunologic disorders. Uh, we have some very important networking uh, partnerships uh, from Cody's uh, Foundation uh, to the Guthy Jackson uh, Foundation to uh, the TM Center at Johns Hopkins. You need to get a website together, Ben. <laughs> uh, to the Accelerated Cure Project and uh, uh, the Christopher and Dana Reeve uh, foundation, which Pauline and I sit on their paralysis task force, in large part because of the advocacy work that Cody and Shelley have done. And these are some of the other organizations that we are partnering with. And if I could do this as a full-time job, we would partner with a lot more. Um, for those of you who were in Seattle, you heard the announcement of our James T. Lubin Fellowship Fund, and um, I would encourage all of you to get involved in supporting this. The, the purpose of this program is to attract physicians into the specializations on ADEM, neuromyelitis optica, transverse myelitis. And uh, it's important that we raise money to make this happen. I don't think it's going to happen uh, on its own. So I would encourage all of you to please get involved in this. And it couldn't be a, uh, there couldn't be a better honor for a more special person on the face of the earth than Jim Lubin. 
so it all began here and this is really where it all ends for me as well thank you Thank you, Sandy, very much. You all, you made it. Um, you survived. Breakfast will be available outside the door to, <laughs> to the left. Uh, seriously, I appreciate this. This is tremendous. This has been a very long, very densely packed uh, day. You are free uh, to seek out dinner where you want. We will be starting tomorrow morning uh, bright and early here. There will be breakfast again. And uh, we'll have another long but important day. Tomorrow is all about how do you make your life better with whatever symptoms you are having today. And so it's, it's a good day and worthwhile to be here. Uh, we're looking forward to it. Everyone have a good evening.